International from Cayman to Cumbria. I, um, I first met Sarah Crowther in Berlin. Uh, and actually, this is a story about um, why for younger lawyers in particular, but perhaps for all of us, to get involved in things like peer pool and any opportunity, particularly in this field, to go abroad and meet local lawyers and so on. And she came up and I've been talking about clinical measurements abroad. I've been dealing with a case called Farage, which most people think of as uh, maybe a non dual duty case, but actually it's greater complexity with me was actually, it was clinical negligence in London for a client in Jordan. And Sarah came up to me and said, we, we do a bit of that stuff in my chambers, three hair court, do you? And, and they're great chambers and great friends of ours. And, and I hadn't appreciated that. And I think it's probably Sarah that taught me that this field should be called travel law. Till then, I called myself a sort of person enjoyer who does some cross-border stuff or cross-border person enjoyer. And, and I found a new vocation. I became a travel lawyer. Uh, she needs no introduction from me. I simply say this. I think she is the best private international law and conflict lawyer that I can think of at the bar, as well as being a great friend. And, and Tom Gibson... Uh, is is actually he's actually quite a northerner. He's moved to Wilmslow. <laughs> <laughs> moved to Wilmslow. In addition to a, a, a really busy practice as an increasingly senior junior in these fields in clinical medicine and first century, he also supports Carlisle United. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you're, you're stealing my thunder. You'll see this on the side. Oh, I, 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 I knew nothing of that. You don't want to hear from me. You want to hear from them. Okay. Yeah, why don't you go for it? Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jared, for that introduction. Um, clinical negligence from the Cayman Islands to Cumbria. Um, part two is uh, Sarah Crowder um, talking about international features. But before we get there, clinical negligence basics, that's what I'm here to talk about. Um, does anybody normally handle clinical negligence claims on a, on a day to day basis, on a weekly basis? <laughs> one, or two, one or two hands going up. I'm relieved to see not a whole room full of hands. Um, you're never quite sure when you do these talks how to pitch them, whether you're going to be too advanced and detailed or far too basic and patronising. Hopefully it won't be too basic and patronising if I go through um, this case, see in North Cumbria, a really useful case on breach of duty, on expert witnesses and on expert evidence and, and how we handle that. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Thank you. Um, Jared's already blown my cover. Um, I do have an emotional attachment to this case just by the name of it, North Cumbria. Um, Carlisle is my home city. Um, it's there on the map for any of you uh, who don't normally go north of Watford, looking at, looking at you, Paul. Um, <laughs> that's where Carlisle is. If you think Manchester's a long trip, keep going and then you get to the great border city that is Carlisle. Um, We've got the Roman wall there. Emperor Hadrian, 2000 years ago, got as far, went all the way from Rome, got to Carlisle and then thought, this is the end of civilization. I'm not going any further. <laughs> he built a wall and uh, that was that. Um, what else have we got on this slide? Carnal Castle, probably most famous for holding Mary, Queen of Scots captive, um, as well as perhaps defining the fortress sort of frontier mentality that some people would say hasn't really left Carlisle in the last 900 <laughs> or, or 2000 years. Um, and finally, as, as Jared says, uh, stealing my thunder, there's, I think my favorite, um, Carlisle United and Zoom backdrop picture, uh, the Jimmy Glass goal in 1999, in the last minute of the last game of the season that kept Carlisle United in the Football League. Um, I could quite happily talk about this all day, but you probably <laughs> have come to see a tourist or a presentation about how wonderful Carlo and Cumbria is. So uh, sadly, I should probably move on. So um, right, back back to sea in North Cumbria. Um, a very sad case featuring um, a mum who came into hospital to give birth to a second child. 
Um, she died due to negligent postnatal care five days after the birth. Um, the case concerned a narrow question, as I put there on this slide. Was it negligent for a midwife to administer a second dose of a drug to induce labour? Um, Mum had come into hospital for an induction, age 41, 41 weeks pregnant, expecting a second baby. Um, the first dose of prostin, the drug to stimulate con contractions, was given in the normal way to induce labour. Um, due to slow progress, seven and a half hours later, the midwife made the fateful judgment call to give the, the second dose of, of prostin. Um, the second dose led to a uterine rupture, an exceptionally rare event, but when it does happen, does in this case a medical emergency. Um, Mum was rushed, rushed to theatre. Um, baby was delivered by a, a forceps. Um, sadly, Mum suffers cardiac arrest and dies five days later. Um, liability for Mum's death was admitted. So this case is about, thank you, um, the claimant's case it was a cerebral palsy case. Um, baby born asphyxiated due to the uterine rupture, due to that drug, the second dose of, of prostin. Um, so baby suffers hypoxic cerebral injury, um, was left with, with cerebral palsy. The defendant denied liability. So we had a one day, quite short, but a one day high court trial on, on breach of duty. Um, and the judge, Mr. Justice Green, put the question that he had to decide there, um, a narrow question, whether in all the circumstances, the administration of three milligrams of prostin at seven o'clock on 9th of December 2002 was below the standard of care that can reasonably be expected of a midwife. So that, that's the issue. That's what Mr. Justice Green has to, to decide one day in the High Court. Um, the law, this is the bit where I was perhaps worried that I'd be patronising everybody, taking you back to tort law at uh, law school, university, however long ago that was. Um, but I have put this on the slide as it's a useful formulation of the Bolam test, which we use near nearly all clinical negligence claims. Um, I'd comment in passing this test has, the Bolam test has stood the test of time. 65 years old this year. There have been some inroads in the last year on consent cases where we've got the Supreme Court's decision on Montgomery and Lanarkshire bringing sort of into the 21st century the idea that when it comes to consenting for treatment, there's more of a dialogue. Medicine's less paternalistic than it used to be. This is the treatment. This is what you're having. So consent cases, we've got slightly different rules in play. But when it comes to cases like this one, a midwife making a clinical decision, making a judgment call. The test that we're applying hasn't changed since Mr. Justice McNair's famous jury direction 65 years ago. Um, in the quote there, he puts it this way, that uh, he is not guilty of medical negligence if he has acted in accordance with a practice accepted as proper by a responsible body, a responsible body of medical men skilled in this particular art. Or, or putting it another way, a man is not negligent if he is acting in accordance with such a practice merely because there is a body of opinion that would take a contrary view. In the present case, always useful to think of how does this Bowen test, how does it apply to the individual case? Um, reformulating it, the judge said the question is whether no reasonably competent midwife would have acted and exercised her judgment in the way midwife Bragg who administered the second dose did. So it was then no reasonably competent midwife would have done that. In the next paragraph, I think a key thing for all medical negligence claims, um, it's insufficient for a claimant just to find an expert, to find a body of opinion that disagrees with the judgment call. You can't have an expert who says, I wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't have prescribed the second dose, I would have done it differently. And um, as the judge says, that's no more than a recognition of the fact that in an area where professionals exercise a high degree of technical and medical expertise, there may be a range of different views, all of which might quite legitimately be held about the same matter. If there exists a body of competent professional opinion which supports a decision as reasonable in the circumstances, it matters not that other experts might, might disagree. We've got the quote there from Lord Scarman going back to uh, 
1984, differences of opinion and practice exist, will always exist in the medical and other professions. And this probably applies to uh, solicitors and barristers' negligence claims as well. Hopefully we don't have to deal with those too often. Um, there's seldom only one answer exclusive of all others to problems of professional judgment. The court may prefer one body of opinion to the other. That is no basis for a conclusion of negligence. Um, also on the law, I've, I've touched on Belitho, the, the Belitho gloss on the Berlin test, as it's sometimes known as. I'm not going to go through this House of Lords decision in great detail, um, but I suppose the key point there, I've summarised from Lord Brown Wilkinson, and that if a, a body of experts, a body of opinion says, yes, this is reasonably competent treatment, a judge doesn't have to, to swallow that whole, doesn't have to follow the experts. If in a rare case you can demonstrate that the professional opinion isn't capable of withstanding logical analysis, the judge is entitled to hold that body of opinion is, is not reasonable or responsible. And so here we come to the guidance, and this is the reason I'm focusing on this case in this talk. Mr Justice Green, um, as he then was, there's a nice, nice picture of him, um, the guidance that he gave. Um, in this one day trial in the High Court, he heard four expert witnesses, two midwives, two obstetricians, one for the claimant, one for the defendant. Um, you might think, I guess, as a layman, as a client coming into medical negligence cases like this, how does the judge decide? Do they just pick their favourite? Do they just, well, if you listen to experts on one side, you listen to experts on the other, you pick your favourite. There's a bit more to it than that. I think this is what Mr Justice Green is trying to delve into in his, his guidance here. So first of all, where a body of appropriate expert opinion considers that an act or omission alleged to be negligent is reasonable, a court will attach substantial weight to that opinion, even if, as we've just seen through the Lord's Garmin quote, um, there's another body of appropriate opinion which condemns the same act or omission as negligent. But the court, when they're making this success assessment, mustn't delegate this task of deciding to the expert. Um, it is an issue that the court, taking account of expert evidence, must decide for itself. How is the court going to make that assessment? How is the court going to test expert evidence? Um, the court should take account of a variety of factors at the bottom there, uh, including but not limited to whether the evidence is tendered in good faith, whether the expert is, quote, responsible, competent and or respectable, and whether the opinion is, is reasonable and logical. The next slide, there's some discussion of, okay, what is responsible, competent, respectable evidence? Yeah. And Mr Justice Green, in the course of his discussions with counsel, both of whom are hugely experienced, in fact, one of them, claimant's counsel, is, is now a High Court judge. We'll, we'll come on to see him later. Um, I query the sort of matters that might fall within these headings. Um, competence, there's a long quote on the slide here, though I've put it all in as this really is useful in, in cases that one deals with every day. Um, thinking specifically of breach of duty, was someone acting reasonably competently in accordance with a responsible body? I've put in red there. If we've got negligence in an NHS setting, um, which we often have, or as Sarah's going to talk about, if it's perhaps abroad or differently, but doctors who say your care will be just the same, I also have an NHS practice, I also have a London practice. Um, particular weight may be accorded to an expert with a lengthy experience in the NHS. And the quote goes on at the end, um, by the same token, an expert who retired 10 years ago, <coughs> whose retirement is spent express, expressing expert opinions, may turn out to be far removed from the fray and much more likely to form an opinion divorced from current practical reality. Uh, sorry, can we go back just a second? Thanks. I'm going to digress a little bit on this slide because when you first start out in practice doing medical negligence, and especially as a barrister, you, you have your conferences, you're in your 20s, you're quizzing all these experts who are in their 50s, 60s, maybe their 70s, distinguished uh, medics, surgeons who've been in practice for decades. 
you almost feel, I guess, cheeky or impertinent to say, well, what is your experience? How many of these procedures have you done? What do you do in a typical week? When did you last do this? And these are the questions we, we do need to ask as, as barristers and questioning in conference and as solicitors looking at CVs. Um, I'll come back to this at the end of one of my conclusions, but I guess if I've learned one thing in the last 10 years doing medical negligence cases, um, expert CVs really do make a difference. Um, the example I'd give was a county court trial I did a, a couple of years ago, county court, so there's no, no famous judgment to look up, but an appendicectomy case, um, the claimant surgeon, funny enough, was someone who I had worked with on other cases. So he was a he was retired, but a perfectly respectable surgical expert. I'd worked with him, had telephone conferences with him. On the other side for the defendant, what I suspected and what my defence surgical expert was telling me was, look, th this expert, um, trial in 2019, he retired from full-time work in 2011, retired from part-time work in 2014. But in the years before he'd retired, he was a general surgeon who'd moved more into breast surgery. General surgery, appendicitis, it was years since he had been performing appendicectomy operations. And that's perhaps a criticism you have to be careful with because a lot of general surgeons, I think, view appendicectomy operations as something for the registrars, something for the trainees. They might be doing the more interesting, intellectually demanding, complicated operations. Um, but partly because of my instigation, we did have in the joint, in the agendas for the joint statement, what is your recent experience and practice of doing appendicectomy operations? I think claimant experts sort of acknowledged then that it was about 15 years since he'd last done one because his practice had moved on to breast surgery and then semi-retirement. Um, you have to be a bit careful cross-examining experts on their experience because what can you come back with if they give an answer you don't like? They know their practice. But given those facts, I thought I was on safe territory. So I did cross-examine them on this. The 15 years turned into 15 to 20 in oral evidence, which perhaps showed his joint statement was being spun slightly in his favour. And it was a legitimate point to make in closing submissions. Look, judge, here's this guidance. Here's two experts with different views. The claimant's case rests on somebody who has not done this operation for 20 years is he in a good position to tell you what is reasonably competent what's a responsible body of opinion in the nhs today um, so thanks that's my digression on on cvs and, and cross-examining as a result uh, respectability also a matter to be taken into account um, i think this probably links to the last slide about CVs that at the end, the responsible expert is one who does not adapt an extreme position, who make necessary concessions, who adheres to the spirit as well as the words of his professional declaration. Um, I could do, I suppose, a whole talk on CPR 35, the expert witness protocol. Um, it will be a bit dry and it would take longer than 20 minutes. So I won't delve into that, but there's one useful thing in the expert witness protocol, again, cross-examination material, a useful test of independence is that the expert, if instructed by the other side, would give the same opinion. Good experts will follow that and they will tell things to you, their instructing solicitors and to, to counsel the lawyers don't want to hear. But if experts are being partisan, are going one side, then that protocol, that would you give the same opinion? instructed by the other sides a useful uh, stick to problem with in cross-examination. Over the page, we've got logic, reasonableness. By far and away, the most important consideration is the logic. Um, here, I've put in the middle, has the expert addressed all sources? So the medical records, an obvious source. Um, nice guidelines. There are guidelines um, on a surprising number of, of issues. Witness statements, that's a point I pick up on. The way all medical negligence claims are run, pre-action, you have to take a view. So if you fraud a claimant, you get the medical records in, you see what the claimant says, you see what an expert says. At that stage, you probably don't know what the defendant says, what the surgeon performed the operation, what the midwife who administered the second dose of the drug, you don't know what they say. And it depends case to case, but when witness evidence comes in, 
experts really do need to think about what the statement says and analyze it. And again, that's something I've used in cross-examination at trial in that most solicitors will get the expert in their served report to list, here's the documents I've seen, and they'll add in the served witness statement at the end from their pre-action screening report for defendant or claimant. Um, when you take them to that page in cross-examination, say you've seen the statement, haven't you? There it is, yes. Okay, let's look at your opinion section. Where's the analysis of what the midwife said, the surgeon said, or what the claimant said if it's about their symptoms and how things progressed? And experts really need, do need to update that. Next slide, I think, thanks. Um, there's Claimant's Counsel, Mr. Uh, Mr. Martin Spencer QC, now Mr. Justice Martin Spencer. He advanced lots of criticisms in this case about errors, mistakes in summarising reports that the defendants' experts had made. Did those criticisms work? Well, I think up to a point, because the defendants' experts maybe hadn't prepared their reports as carefully, as assiduously as they could have done. And of course, this is always looking back through the lens of a case that goes to trial. I guess 90%, 99% of medical negligence cases, maybe our cases don't, and the few that do, you always think, could you have done more at trial? Um, but the judge did say, if on analysis, the opinion conveyed from a person of real experience, exhibiting competence and respectability, and it's consistent with the surrounding evidence and internally logical, this is an opinion which a judge should attach considerable weight to. Yes, thanks. Um, I could take this slide briefly. This is just to say that this guidance isn't something I thought of for a talk this afternoon, and it has featured in 11 High Court decisions since. Um, it's there in Clark and Lintel and, and Jackson and Powell. So th this guidance from Mr Justice Green does have some, some weight to it now. Um, what happened specifically in, in back to the case, see in North Cumbria, where we have the two midwives, the two obstetricians. Um, 73, I think, is a key paragraph that I would highlight, possibly more useful for defendants than, than claimants, but this idea that, well, the approach I take with this, with this evidence, consistent with, with the law, is to assess the defendant's, ed defendant's evidence to see whether it falls within the bounds of reasonable evidence and is consistent and logical in the context of the wider evidence. I assess the claimant's evidence not to see whether it is in and of itself reasonable, it is, it is reasonable, but to determine whether the claimant's expert's evidence has the effect of placing the defendant's expert evidence in such an altogether negative light that I should reject that evidence. So that's the hurdle, perhaps a high hurdle for claimants to prove a trial. It's not just, I like the claimant expert more, but it puts the defendant's evidence in quotes, such an altogether negative light, which should be rejected. Um, the result in this case, although the claimant's expert obstetrician was impressive, quotes at 77, um, the judge didn't accept it because this is the Bolan test in action. It was simply too rigorous and too cautious. And it, in paragraph 78, it would have been reasonable for the midwife to have adopted the claimant's cautious approach, not giving the second drug. Um, but the test is whether that is the only possible reasonable reaction in all the circumstances. Um, and to this, I formed the clear view that the less cautious approach was not a negligent or unreasonable approach, also fell within the bounds of reasonable and normal midwifery treatment. I guess I'd add to that, hindsight is something we, we have to guard against in medical negligence cases. We know now, the experts all knew, the lawyers all knew the terrible, tragic outcome in this case. But applying the Bowen test, you have to focus in on what the doctors, midwives, nurses, surgeons are doing at the time. They don't know what's going to happen in future. So without hindsight, was it a reasonable professional judgment to make? So the conclusion in this case, the midwife did act within the bounds of reasonable judgment. She might have taken a more cautious view. Had she done so, the tragedy would have been avoided. Um, but this reflects the fact that a range of possible reasonable actions that might have been taken the decision was within the range. So uh, sadly for the claimant, claim dismissed. 
brings me just about in time, I think, onto the last slide. <laughs> With apologies to George Orwell, <laughs> um, thinking of a CV point. I think, again, if I've learned one thing in a decade, it's all experts are equal, but some experts are more equal than others. How can we get the best out of our cases? Um, expert choice and CV is hugely important. Um, when it comes to reports, joint statements, have we addressed everything, even the things we don't want to address? Better for the expert to acknowledge, analyze the other side's witness statements and say, but viewed against the totality of the evidence, the records, my normal experience, this is still my opinion. And, and then at trial, um, can experts adapt as necessary? Can they give reasonable and, and logical evidence? That is the quick tour of experts and their guidance. So I'll hand over to part two. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. I'm actually going to stand in front of this table because I'm only five foot one and the table is about <laughs> four foot eight. Um, does this actually work, this clicker, or am I just kind of... Um, just wave it. Wave it. <laughs> we'll yeah, just stick that. So. Okay. Um, so, obviously, um, I mean, this part all came around. I'm not quite sure how we got to that bit. But, I mean, when we're looking at cross-border clinical negligence issues, they arise, in my experience, in a, in a, in a few different ways. And Tom's obviously taking you through cases which, which do happen where, for whatever reason, you have a claimant who is under the auspices of NHS type care. The classic situations are people who are government employees, classically Ministry of Defence, who've been stationed abroad and where there are local subcontracts which basically promise to provide um, care which is similar to or equivalent to that which you would receive on the NHS and if you're looking for examples of those kind of litigated cases um, there's a case called A, a child from 2004 which is in the Court of Appeal were you involved in that one Derek? I was yeah. <laughs> and, I uh, and, and there's, there's also um, a more recent one called Roberts which raises all sorts of interesting and horrible headache questions about um, the contribution, the 78 Contribution Act as well for conflicts purposes, but it's also another interesting analysis of the content of the duty of care where um, families of um, Ministry of Defence workers are stationed abroad and they come under the kind of NHS umbrella, in which case you're applying English law, albeit that the facts have occurred elsewhere. Um, a second category of case with which I've had a lot of involvement is where you kind of import your clients as well. So if you've got people who are passing through the UK, who end up having mm -hmm. NHS treatment for whatever reason, uh, but are actually nationals of um, other states, um, then uh, those claims obviously have um, a cross-border element. I'm not going to talk about any of them. What I'm going to talk about is medical tourism, um, which um, is a bit of a, a pejorative label, actually, because um, there are lots of reasons why people travel for treatment. Um, people travel into the UK uh, for treatment because of the reputation of particular clinics or clinicians and out of the UK similarly. Um, and it has been subject to statistical analysis. I've got there on the slide some, you know, over 140,000 people in 2016 travelled outside the UK for um, clinical treatment. Um, travel was to 31 countries in total, but there, there were most of the overwhelming majority went to just eight countries. Who wants to volunteer where people go for their, for their treatment? Exactly. Thank you. Uh, Czech, any, Republic. Czech Republic. Yeah, oh, you're doing really well. Anybody else? Poland. Poland, yes. Latvia, Lithuania, Hungary. Actually, France is high on the list as well. But the reality is that a lot of these decisions are cost driven. And it's not, therefore, surprising that a lot of the cases that you see concern people who wanting to have treatments which are genuinely not funded on the NHS. So, cosmetic treatment. Um, very often after um, kind of weight loss surgery and, and other surgery, people want to have cosmetic treatment and that is not then funded on the NHS. Bariatric treatment, similarly, dental and also um, fertility cases. Um, they're all going to raise different clinical negligence issues um, because it obviously it depends very much where the service is being provided. And some of these um, situations you have initial consultations on, on Harley Street or Wimpole Street, and then somebody will go out to Poland or the Czech Republic or whatever for, um, for surgery. So you just need to be a little bit careful about exactly 
what your allegations of breach are and where the events have actually risen and also where the damage has arisen as well as we come on to see. Right, I'm going to try this now. Oh, right, this is me basically showing that I know how to do a screenshot on my new phone. <laughs> okay. Um, I did a kind of quick Google search as to, you know, I just put in cheap cosmetic surgery. You get all these flash websites. To be honest, a lot of them look perfectly respectable and it's not all kind of, um, kind of bargain basement or whatever. But you can see, um, I mean, this one here says overnight stay in Poland at the clinic brackets if required. And that's after a kind of major abdominal surgery. Um, and this one obviously is focusing very much on, on, on the prices. This is one um, in Prague. Um, so it's very easy for consumers in the UK to access um, these kind of websites. You see they're all in English. They're all, um, there's nothing on there. A lot of them have got co.uk website tags there's nothing on there that suggests anything other than that this is the kind of service that lots of people in the UK are um, accessing and so the internet has been a big driver for uh, for a lot of this right, I'm going to try again no it's not working is it please Ricky okay right you've had all your fun now I've got to get into some of the boring legal stuff so um, I'm going to whiz through it because we've only got 10 minutes and I'm not going to keep you beyond that I promise um, there are um, I think in my mind kind of four key issues that we need to just think about in terms of cross-border uh, clinical negligence. Obviously, key jurisdiction, and you've heard a little bit about that in general terms already from, um, from uh, Karen, law uh, governing the claim. Who is your contract with? It generally is a contract, um, not always. Sometimes you've got a tort claim, but just be a little bit careful about who your contract is with. I mean, if you're going out to contract for, I mean, talk, going back to the idea of had. Um, weight loss surgery and you may be wanting abdominoplasty or something like that are you contracting with an individual surgeon um or is somebody actually contracting with a hospital or a provider um you know you've got to remember that in uk scenario if you're having treatment under the nhs there are various different duties that the nhs do generally accept in clinical negligence scenarios so it's not just that the treatment that's provided will be not negligent but they're also um, but a wider duty for your general health and care whilst you're admitted to hospital um, and also before and after treatment and things like that. Um, and we'll come on to look at an example case, which I know some of you in the room will be very familiar with um, in a minute or two. But quite often the terms of the contract can be quite unclear as well. And then finally, just have a think about what the standards of care are and, and the good old Kind of local standards point from which all people who deal with package holiday cases are familiar how that how that plays in right i'm gonna have another go at this no it's not gonna work okay so starting point is is it a package because it could well be i mean actually if you contracted to have accommodation or travel plus whatever services could fall within although we don't think of it as a package holiday it's not like two weeks in benedorm is it but um it could fall within the regulations so don't forget to have that um, in mind and um, more likely in reality is what you're looking at for jurisdiction are the consumer con uh, contract jurisdiction rules which have been silently snuck into the civil justice and um, uh, judgments act uh, 1982 it's a bit of a kind of post-brexit sweetener um, what we've done uh, or what our government has done for us is basically adopted what were the rules in brussels one in respect of consumers and kind of made them um, part of UK law. So there they are, sections 15b to 15e. They're very familiar to those of us who dealt with Brussels and Lugano before. The consumer can bring the claim against the other party to the consumer contract who has to be a trader or professional. And uh, that, that trader or professional either has to trade in the UK or by any means direct their professional activities. And I should say not just the UK, to that part of the UK where the consumer is actually domiciled. So if you're looking at someone who is English domiciled, then you will need to show that the professional is directing their activities to <coughs> England and Wales. Generally speaking, quite easily done in light of the Court of Justice decision in PAMA and Reader Eye, which basically says that almost anything that's on the internet with an international flavor, especially if it's got kind of UK telephone numbers or is in English, it is, is likely to meet the direct by any means test. So um, that would be your route to jurisdiction. Um, kind of slight red flag, obviously CJJA, 
as we all know, does have the foreign convenience test built into it as well. So you don't get full carte lunch like you did under Brussels 1A. So you do still need to have one eye um, to foreign convenience. I should put that on the slide. Sorry about that. Right. Um, can I do this? No, this is just not working. Um, I'm not going to go over all this again because you've all heard me talk about Brownlee at Brownlee. And um, so you would potentially have jurisdiction for a tort claim um, uh, if um, you can show damage here. Um, just the bottom case on there, which is Eleanor Dupuis, that's the um, HIPS litigation. Um, you just need to bear in mind that um, in clinical negligence, obviously there's usually quite or quite often a, rel a time gap between the different parts of the tort, and there can obviously be quite often a time gap between the negligence occurring and even the damage occurring, but knowledge of that arising, because obviously sometimes if you've had clinical treatment, you might not know till later. I mean, it's obvious if you get an immediate infection and it all goes horribly wrong and you have to go to A&E, but you might not know till later till another clinician looks at you and says, actually, that operation that you had was negligently done. So you just need to be alive to the fact that the timing in clinical negligence and when the damage arises and where the claimant is when the damage arises, the knowledge of the damage can be material to or particularly applicable law, not so much your jurisdiction. Thanks. Um, and again, I'm not going to I'm not going to spend very long on this because we're going to have some talks later about foreign pavilions. Um, but you will need to demonstrate if you're applying for service out or permission to serve out that you've got a reasonable case to answer in a clinical negligence context. That is going to mean having some evidence that the treatment fell below a reasonable standard. And that may be by reference to a standard that applies outside England and Wales, as opposed to um, a standard here, depending on exactly what it is that you're alleging. Yes, please. Okay. Um, again, we can pop over this slide, actually, Vicky, because I think somebody else, given the time that we've got. Um, I did want to talk about this, though. So what is going to be the law that applies? Um, if you have got a consumer contract, so again, take my example of someone who post weight loss surgery wants to go and have a tummy tuck in, I don't know, Prague or something like that, contracts over the internet. Um, under Rome 1, which obviously is still part of the English law post Brexit, Article 6 1, the likelihood is that that contract is governed by English law. Um, as long as the contract falls within the scope of activities that the professional is directing to the consumer in England and Wales. Um, that's obviously quite helpful. Um, it's rather different from um, what you might have seen in kind of road traffic situations, and it's obviously different from Odenbright. Um, but that is usually a starting point. It's not universal. And of course, it might be that there are other terms and conditions. There are also locking clauses, which mean that the professional can't kind of contract out of that to stop, to make an, a law other than England and Wales um, applicable. But that's something you need to have early regard to in, in these clinical negligence cases. Yes, please. Um, if you do want to run a claim in tort, and I suppose that might be foreseeable, for example, if you wanted to... Uh, bring a claim directly against the insurer of a clinician if that's permissible under the local law where the um, the treatment took place. Um, then under point one of Article four of Rome two, then the place, the country where the place, the damage sustained um, will be applicable. So you know, in my example, you go to Prague, um, it's negligently performed, you get an infection, um, that would then lead to. Um, that would then lead to public, um, Czech Republic law applying to the tort claim. Um, just be a little bit aware, um, Article 4.3 might not be your friend there, because if you do have a consumer contract to which English law applies, then that's a pre-existing relationship which is material. And I think, certainly my view is that you would face an argument about whether Article 4.3 would displace the Article 4.1 um, rules there, um, which might then influence whether you'd want to bring a direct action against the insurer or not. So you might just want to think carefully about the interaction between who your defendants are and what that's going to do to your applicable law. Thank you. 
Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Clark. I know some of you were in that case, so apologies if I get it all horribly wrong, you can tell me later. Um, but I mean, the, the head, this was a recent case, which was rather unusual. Um, Clark against Kalachinsky, who uh, is a Polish um, clinician who had practiced very briefly in the NHS as a very junior doctor in Milton Keynes, I think, somewhere, um, then gone back to Poland kept his GMC registration, set himself up as a plastic surgeon website, not dissimilar to one of the ones I showed you before. Um, Ms. Clark, um, who wanted uh, plastic surgery, had then found the website of the clinic with which Mr. Kalachinsky was associated and through various emails um, arranged to fly out to Poland and to have uh, to stay in a hotel, she made all her own personal travel arrangements, stay in a hotel, and to have, um, frankly, what seemed to me to be rather major surgery, uh, without really knowing who it was that she was um, contracting with. Um, I should say another feature of these cases, in my experience, is that because there's a pressure on cost, sometimes um, claimants will go out and they will have several procedures all in one go. So, you know, they're having liposuction and the breast augmentation and the tummy tuck and everything all at once. And it's like really kind of quite distressing actually to kind of think about, you know, the amount of surgery that they've gone through and then they're just packed off to a hotel um, afterwards. Um, and she just, she went out there and then literally she gets to the clinic and say, right, you're good to go. Where's your credit card? She literally hands it over and pays um, there and then gets people the heat. Um, okay, so it all then goes a bit wrong. Um, immediately afterwards, she's feeling a bit shivery and, and not great. Um, overnight, she's got more symptoms of infective process um, beginning. After a couple of days, they managed to get Mr. Kalachinsky to come back from wherever it was, the golf course or wherever, and he removes the implants. Um, but basically, nothing is really done to manage the infective process. She gets worse and worse and worse. Eventually, um, I think one of her parents effectively rescues her and takes her back to a &E in Southampton where they save her life because she's got sepsis and she's nearly dead. Yeah. So um, what does she do? Well, she sues um, the insurer of the surgeon and she sues the surgeon and she sues uh, an entity called NOAA Clinic, which had a very vague, unclear relationship with the surgeon. And the litigation seems to have gone off on a very odd footing because neither the surgeon nor the clinic really responded to the claim. Um, and then belatedly at the last minute, the surgeon's insurer kind of woke up and thought, oh, hang on a minute, we're in line to pay some money out here, we better do something. So they kind of turned up at trial, not seemingly having done anything before and started kind of throwing out arguments. That's what the judgment looks like anyway. Um, so it was agreed in this case that the contract law was English law, but that the... Um, uh, tort claim against the insurer uh, was going to be under Polish law. Again, I assume that's because without that, there wouldn't have been a direct right, right of action at all under the English law. Um, I slightly wonder about that, whether that's right or not. Um, as it happened, it had been agreed. But I can see in another case, you might have issues about whether in those circumstances you could really get away with running a Polish law claim against the insurer alongside English law contract cases um, against the clinic and the surgeon. Yes, please. How are we doing for time? Oh, I'm over. I said I wasn't going to, but I am. Right, two minutes. So it was a very old case. There was practically no evidence about what was in the contract. The poor judge was having to kind of stitch it all together based on a few emails. Made a finding that effectively the contract was between the surgeon and the clinic. I have to say, if the case had been kind of more rigorously thought, fought, I would have expected there to be a lot more discussion and disclosure about who the correct contracting party um, was and there was also a bit of a lacuna in the Polish law evidence about and this is no criticism of anyone this is because the defendant had kind of turned up at the 11th hour with a kind of list of issues that it might like to run there was no evidence that the, um, the surgeon was an employee of the clinic or the vicarious liability at this point again something that you would need to cover off I think if you were having one that was kind of fought properly yeah um, so there was a bit of a discussion about what was the need to set out the Polish law in that case. Um, I mean, it's there in Brownlee what you need to do. Um, you can't just simply go Polish law applies and then sit back and then 
just make out that it's all the same as what the English law would be. The burden is on the party relying on that Polish law cause of action to set out what the relevant principles are and how you can rely on them. How does it give you a cause of action? Again, I think the judge feeling a little bit sorry for the claimant having been ambushed in this fashion gave permission to amend mid-trial, but frankly, I wouldn't want to have to rely on that. Um, yes. And finally, and perhaps the most interesting point that arises out of the judgment, frankly, is the question about um, local standards and how does that interface with clinical negligence? Because we all know from package travel type litigation that defendants will very often say, well, you can't assert, you know, Wilson and Best, all those cases, you can't assert just because something would have been the standard in England and Wales, that it would apply in Poland. Um, and the judge made pretty short shrift of that. She said, well, look, I'm not totally persuaded that this is at all relevant because it's a completely different field. But she said, well, even if it were, this expert who the claimant did have evidence from, a plastic surgeon, has expressed himself in such trenchant terms about the lack of care provided here that it's inconceivable that anybody could ever have said that, well, that's all fine in Poland. You just introduce infection and then do nothing about it and then take the implants out and still do nothing about the infection. That's frankly absurd. So it was quite an extreme case on breach of duty, but I can envisage quite easily a situation where perhaps it's more nuanced or perhaps you've got more kind of subtle presentation of what was or wasn't done in which case there may be questions and it may be an issue when you're selecting experts or you're speaking to your experts along the lines that Tom was mentioning earlier, that you need to explore with them the fact that there might be different processes. So, for example, I mean, take a completely different example, if you're talking about should somebody have an MR scan or a CT scan, you know, you would expect your NHS expert to say, well, you would do that in six hours, you do it in 12 hours or whatever, which is all fine in the context of their experience in the NHS, but whether they're really competent to give those kind of timings in a case which is happening perhaps in a private clinic in Poland is a whole different question again. So you do need to have one eye on exactly what it is that went wrong in terms of whether your expert is going to be able to give the relevant opinion. So it might not be a question of local standards as such in the kind of package travel sense. But I can see that when you're looking at your experts and what they can give evidence towards, you need to be quite careful that you've analysed and identified exactly what your causative breaches of duty are. And then having gone well over, and sorry about that, you will get your little break in a minute. Thank you very much. Anybody?